Hey everyone, this is Rohan from Mindfulness Everywhere and this is the first of our review videos. Now in the future we'll be reviewing things like apps and games and books, but today is slightly different um, in that I'll be reviewing uh, this, which is the Mindful Nation UK report. So a couple of weeks ago I was down in London uh, for the launch of the report, uh, which was held in uh, Portcullis House, just next to the House of Parliament. So just to give a bit more context about what, what we're talking about, so the subtitle for this, you might not be able to read it, um, is Report by the Mindfulness All-Party Parliamentary Group, uh, October 2015. And what that means is that for the last, I think, year or so, a group of cross-party uh, cross members of parliament convened a conversation, in a way, about mindfulness and exploring what this opportunity is, the opportunity for mindfulness in different aspects of public life and over the course of that process they invited a number of people to uh, share their experiences, um, spoke to a number of different experts across all parts of the mindfulness community and just really just to unpick the, um, the opportunity that mindfulness has in the UK. It was a really really uh, excellent event actually, the launch itself it was packed there was a lot of energy and buzz. Um, it was actually really exciting to see the, the level of attendance, um, uh, not only in numbers, but also the, the type of people there. Not only were there obviously parliamentarians um, and uh, civil servants and a number of different um, people around, in and around the mindfulness community in the UK, there were actually three ministers there, which was pretty amazing. There was Tracy Crouch, who is the Minister for Sport, there was a minister from the health uh, uh, department and there was even Nikki Morgan, who's the Secretary of State for Education. Um, and all three um, of those ministers spoke about their interest and excitement and uh, in mindfulness and its opportunity. And particularly, uh, I was really, really actually amazed that um, Nikki Morgan was there given she's like obviously in the Premier League and the, the cabinet to have someone of that standing at the Mindful Nation report um, was not just a coup, but it was a testament to the, the great quality of the work that had been done to bring it all together. The key thing to know is that the report is broken up into different parts. So it's looking at the opportunity for mindfulness in four main areas of public life. And those four, four areas are health, health service, education, the workplace, and criminal justice. So if you're interested in any of those four areas, it's definitely worth a look. And each of those sections also have specific recommendations. Um, across the whole uh, document, I think there are 12 or 14 specific recommendations um, offered uh, effectively to, to government um, and other uh, third sector and sort of charity partners, I guess. And just as a bit of an example of what those recommendations are, I'll just read a couple out. So one from the health section, those living with a long-term physical health condition and history of recurrent depression should, give you, should be given access to mindfulness-based uh, cognitive therapy, which is one of the main uh, mindfulness-based therapies, especially to those who do not want to take antidepressant medication. This will require assessment of mental health needs within physical health care services and appropriate referral pathways in place. Um, one from education. The Department of Education should, de should designate three teaching schools, which is basically a new scheme, which is where uh, schools become specialists in particular things. Three teaching schools to pioneer mindfulness teaching, coordinate and develop innovation, test models, and so on, and disseminate best practice. So there's some really interesting uh, recommendations in here. Um, they're relatively top level, but again, that's, that's sort of where we are as a, as a conversation, in, especially in public policy. But I think they're really interesting and definitely worth looking at. And the section that I just really wanted to really pull out um, is uh, chapter six in the, in the report, which is called the Implementation Challenge. Um, so basically how, <laughs> um, how do we do all this? And it identifies five particular, what they call urgent questions, all of which need to be addressed as uh, mindfulness grows. I just wanna sort of bring them out, because these are, these are questions which are really close to my heart and our heart here at Mindfulness Everywhere. So the first one is, where will the mindfulness teachers come from? Now, 
that's a really, really important question. I think underlying that is this report's understanding that the majority of mindfulness training and teaching and mindfulness in general will be delivered through effectively face-to-face -face teaching classes around the, um, the MBSR or MBCT, which is sort of the classic six to eight week style teaching programs. Um, and that makes total sense to me, given that um, those are the those are the those courses are the ones which have the most research. The second one is how to extend reach. So when it says reach, I think that also really means bringing mindfulness to people who might be in what we might call hard to reach uh, communities or have accessibility issues. Um, may not have access to face-to-face, -face, may not even have access to technologies, and so on. The third question they point out is, how can the quality of mindfulness-based intervent interventions be maintained? Related to that is, how can the integrity that is critical to mindfulness teaching be upheld? So, this is a concern. This this, these concerns around quality and integrity um, are described actually really well in here. Sorry, the fifth one um, is how can the mindfulness teaching profession develop effective regulation? Now, in a way, I think uh, these last three questions around quality, integrity and regulation are related um, in that uh, there's a concern amongst parts of the mindfulness community that um, particularly in the teaching on the teaching side of things is that as uh, things like apps and um, digital modes of delivery grow that uh, by definition some people believe that quality will decrease. I don't necessarily agree with that. The use of the word regulation is very interesting. It raises a really interesting question around what, the, what would that even mean? There are still lots of people who are not necessarily qualified teachers um, in, a, in a sort of classical MBSR or MB, MBCT sense, but what they create um, is of high quality and also um, is helping a lot of people. Um, so obviously I'm, a, I'm perhaps biased because it's something that I'm in that category. So yes, these, que these questions of integrity and quality I do think are really important. Um, I'm not 100% sure that regulation is the way to, to get there, but then um, I think there's, there is something quite different between um, teaching in a school, teaching in uh, a criminal justice, a prison environment, um, teaching in a health uh, environment, which is very, very different actually to um, teaching in, or mindfulness in general. So I guess there are a couple of things I feel are slightly missing from the report, um, which is not a criticism. I think they've done a really great job. Um, uh, but I think just, just from my perspective, as someone who thinks about this stuff a lot, the first thing is around digital delivery. Whilst apps and other things are mentioned, uh, I guess, in the report, what isn't mentioned so much is how the opportunity of d digital delivery to take the pressure off physical face-to-face -face teaching um, because if we are to grow mindfulness to the scale where the number of people who could benefit it from it um, receive it then we just we're just nowhere near uh, being able to have that number of uh, teachers available uh, I'm interested in how we might explore different ways of uh, digital delivery for people and again looking at access and reach different types of people um, as well who have different types of technology base and I think my uh, what I would what I'm most excited about is actually um, and maybe uh, something that we're we're doing in a way anyway but is looking at how do we actually invent new ways of uh, training mindfulness um, uh, using technology that isn't purely replicating face-to-face -face models. This is a big bugbear and slash passion slash interest of mine and I think the I think there's a there's a big opportunity for um, the people who are really expert in 
face-to-face -face delivery to start to understand the opportunities of uh, the way people engage with technology um, in different ways rather than see it as a threat. I think there can be a concern that quality is mutually exclusive of quantity and that if, if something can reach a lot of people it's intrinsically not very good. I disagree with that assumption. I think it can be the case where um, large volume things um, aren't that good but that absolutely does not have to be the case. So I think there's a big opportunity for people who maybe have been involved in this report to start to understand more about the digital landscape from, from the perspective of what's actually happening now already within the mindfulness uh, marketplace if you like and also within um, just user behavior in general. I think there's a massive opportunity and I'm personally uh, really uh, delighted to help with that and I'm sure I'll be um, uh, reaching out to a bunch of people who've uh, taken part in the report to see who's interested in that kind of thing. And I guess the other, the other thing that I felt missing from the report was just actually how the, it felt like as a report, and I understand, absolutely understand why it was like this, and I think it's absolutely right, and what I would call it's a, uh, it was very much focused around an institutional audience. So obviously it's talking to government, and it's also it's looking at the gatekeepers of Michael's being schools and uh, health service and prisons and companies. I understand that, um, why that's a sensible place to start, but I think there's actually, an, there's obviously another way completely, which is going straight to people. So whether they're young people who happen to be in school, but primarily they're young people, or they're people who happen to work in a company, or people who happen to have particularly particular mental health issues or um, just well-being issues. What would it be like if we actually looked at um, uh, focusing directly on on the individual rather than on the gatekeeper institution? I think there's a really interesting phenomenon right now in that mindfulness is becoming such a buzzword um, that there's actually a bit of a danger that the conventional mindfulness community becomes a bit bypassed um, and is a little bit slow to deal with the change in people's demand and their, their behavior and even their understanding of mindfulness. The fact that one single book called the Mindfulness Coloring Book has sold more units in the UK than every other conventional mindfulness book put together. Now I think that's really interesting because if I was to interview, I guess, all the people involved in putting the mindfulness report, they would look at a thing like the Mindfulness Coloring Book and say, well, I saw it's sort of to do with calming down and attention and so on, but they wouldn't say it's, it's a mindfulness training, anything to do with the mindfulness as is technically defined both in the report um, and elsewhere. And so I think we're, at a, we're in a really interesting moment where the popular understanding of mindfulness driven by um, people which, products which are more able to get to market quicker and, and are focused on people could actually uh, move a bit too fast for the more sort of academic and public sector time cycles um, of uh, the more conventional mindfulness conversation as, re as sort of represented in this report. Finally, just to sort of finish this video off, just to sort of say again, it was a, it's a really fabulous report and I do recommend uh, anyone interested in the development of mindfulness reading it. Um, I'll obviously set, I'll put a link to the, you can download the PDF um, online for free and I'll set, put a link to it just down in the, in the section there. Um, but just to really celebrate the fact that the report exists at all, it's a real, real landmark, um, I think, for mindfulness in the UK that uh, an all-party all party, all party parliamentary group, and it's tricky to say, uh, was put together and also supported by the fact that there have been mindfulness classes in uh, Parliament uh, for the last 18 months, two years as well, led by Chris Cullen and Tessa Watt, which um, have seen over 100, I think 120 MPs gone through those courses. And I think as many, again, um, civil servants and staff members around Parliament as well. 
which is an amazing thing. Um, the fact that a quarter, a quarter or so of MPs have done formal mindfulness training is amazing. And actually, I think that, that really was a sort of bring out a highlight from the actual event. Uh, was one of the um, one of the ministers who spoke, Tracy Crouch, who until recently was actually a co-chair of the parliamentary group, but she got promoted to be minister of sport, and so had to uh, let go of her uh, parliament, uh, mindfulness parliamentary group responsibility. Um, and she at, at the event she spoke incredibly candidly about how she discovered the mindfulness class as someone who suffers from uh, a certain level of anxiety and depression. She tried the course and found it incredibly useful. And it was just a really amazing to see a top level minister um, speaking about her own mental health issues and speaking about the effect that, um, but effectively only like, uh, like a, that, that the short course in mindfulness really gave her uh, was a really uh, wonderful and lovely thing. But again, just a big, um, a big well done to everyone at the mindfulness initiative for putting the report together. And I guess, um, the big question is what happens next and I guess there's a lot of work to do um, in uh, taking these, rec these excellent recommendations and pushing them forward um, but in the meantime and whilst there's a lot whilst that will, will be a challenge uh, I'm sure uh, it's definitely worth celebrating um, the work that's been done so far with the, with the group um, so there you go. So thanks for watching that's been uh, this week's review I hope you enjoyed it. Do let us know if there's anything else you'd like us to review. We've got a bunch of stuff lined up that we'll be doing in the next couple of weeks. So look out for that. And do please subscribe to the channel clicking our little logo in the corner.